Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Miriam priests here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and we are excited that you are with us because today is one of those in the long line of beautiful church calendar, the, uh, one of the most important days. In fact, the church fathers said that this moment was the single most important moment in human history. Even the resurrection came because of this moment. What is this moment? This moment is the Annunciation. And that's going to be the topic. And I promise you there'll be some things you've probably never heard because I want to share with you some things that are really amazing that we don't hear about. And so let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us that we may give you our yes, our fiat, as Mary did to be able to say yes to your will and to be able to be disciples of Christ through this momentous moment that Mary brought through your grace, the Savior to the world. We ask that we open our minds and hearts to receive this grace you wish to bestow. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, so you are super going back with me to seminary today because I went back and, you know, I, I realized, and I apologize to all the viewers, I told the people here in the shrine, I announced earlier that we were going to be doing discerning God's will, and I know some of you might be tuning in for that, I apologize because, yes, I was planning on doing that, and late last night, God shifted gears on me, and as I started doing, finishing that talk, I realized today's the Annunciation. I've never done a talk on the Annunciation, and there is so much there, so dug out the seminary notes, um, and you know what? I actually found some work by Brant Petrie. If any of you have ever seen his work, phenomenal, phenomenal. And so I'm going to borrow a little bit from him. But I'm going to take you back to seminary because this is one of the most important moments, if not the most important moment in human history. But what happened? Okay, so now, the Annunciation of Mary and the Incarnation of the Word, capital W, the Eternal Word, constitute the deepest mystery the deepest between God and man. And as I said, the most important event in the history of mankind. Without the Annunciation and the fiat of Mary, there is no resurrection. And so, although it is no longer a holy day of obligation, this is disappointing, it is still a solemnity. And so, yes, it's not a holy day of obligation, but I'm going to start lobbying. I'm, I'm meeting with Cardinal Togley um, in uh, June. I'm going to be like, please, put this back. Put this back. Um, so anyway, um, let's look at our, our, our first slide, or our next slide. Um, not only did I pull up my seminary notes, which were amazing, and I went through it, but, but I found some stuff by Brant Petrie that he did on God fulfilling his promise to the house of David. And, but he did it in the most unexpected way, how God kept his promise to the house of David, but so unexpectedly. Now, let's go to our next, well, before we do, actually, what did Gabriel, and the angel, we all know the story of the Annunciation, so I'm not going to read the whole long thing out of the scriptures right now, but basically Gabriel said what to Mary when he appeared to her? Let's look at it, put it on the slide now. Basically, the child will be great, okay? Next, he said, the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, okay? Next, Gabriel said, he will be called holy, the son of the most high. He will be called the son of the most high. And next, of his kingdom, there will be no End. Now, this is extremely important. This is what I'm going to share with you that I learned in seminary, but I think Brant Petrie did a better job than my own seminary instructors on this one, and so I'm going to borrow. Now, basically, there are four elements here. 
This is what we never learned. I, didn't, I haven't learned this in seminary. And, and, and thank goodness for people like Brand Petrie that can remind us of this because this is exactly what I learned and want to share with you. So again, taking you back to seminary. But there are four elements here. One, greatness. He will be great. Two, he will take the throne. Okay, uh, that's two. Three, he will be the son of God. And four, his kingdom will have no end. These are the four elements that we hear Gabriel say in the Annunciation of Mary. But it's going to be critically important, okay? Because we're hearing now in the New Testament what is actually a prophecy in the Old Testament made to David. And this is what's amazing. And sorry, I hacked my face up this morning shaving. So, and I'm on blood thinners. So when you, when you, when you, when you shave, you get the slightest little nick, it just bleeds and bleeds and bleeds. So sorry about this. Um, so anyway, this is actually an Old Testament prophecy made to David. If you want to know where, it's 2 Samuel chapter 7. And I want to read some of that. But basically, why did David, wasn't David this huge sinner? I remember my dad saying, you know, something's really wrong. David killed more people than Hitler. You know, why would, why would we honor this guy? Okay, the difference between David and Hitler is David had, he was a special king, unlike a dictator like Hitler, because he wants God to be at the center of his kingdom. This is what made David different from every other king at that time. All the other kings, they wanted to be king. Hitler, he wanted to be king. Dictator, Ma, um, um, Stalin, Mao, they want to be king. The difference with David is David wanted God to be at the center. Now, David brought the ark to Jerusalem and be in, was able to start that process of putting God at the center. So what did he do? He brought God in the ark to the center, the center of Israel, Jerusalem. Now, David sees that he's got this big palace, all right? He's got this big palace and, and then realizes there's something wrong with that. Kind of like some of our televangelists, right? That are living in those $100 million mansions. Don't they see something's wrong with that? And so David did. He saw something was wrong with this. He says, I got this big palace and God's living in this tiny tabernacle. He says, we need a house for God to dwell in. The tabernacle was what was mobile in the desert. But then David said, no, he needs something bigger. And they built what? A temple. So let's look at our next slide. This is the temple. So he wants something better than just a tabernacle. He wants to build a temple for God. That's why we have a tabernacle for God. But then the church is the temple. Do you know that Mother Angelica at EWTN, they called her, which she built there, a temple? And so David said, I want this temple. <clears throat> so let's go to our next slide because what did God tell David? Listen to this. This is the Old Testament now, but look how it relates to the Annunciation. Here's what God told David, quote, I will raise up your offspring after you. Now this is 2 Samuel chapter 7, okay? I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Now David, or uh, Jesus comes from the line of David, right? I will be his father. But wait a minute, he just said he comes from you, David. Jesus did. But then God says he will be my son. Jesus was. And he says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So get this, everybody. The same four elements that Gabriel just mentioned to Mary are here. David's dynasty will be great. How do we know that? It will be made sure before me. So we have greatness he will establish the throne of David's kingdom. That's what the angel said. The Lord will give him his throne of his father, David. Next, God describes the offspring of David as his own. He will be called the son of God. 
And you know, this is the first time that an individual person was ever designated as the son of God. Israel as a nation was designated the son of God, but never an individual. And then finally, God promises that his kingdom will stand forever. In those words I just read, he says, the throne shall be established forever. The exact four things that God promised uh, David in 2 Samuel 7 are the exact four things the angel said to Mary. Now, what happens? All right, these four elements are there. They're in the Annunciation. So let's look at our next slide. Isn't that a beautiful painting? Gabriel is basically pronouncing the fulfillment of that promise to David. How come we don't learn this? So what's going on? Gabriel is pronouncing the fulfillment of the promise of God to David. It is now taking place through Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus is the son of God. This is who Jesus is. Oh, but I don't believe in Jesus. Well, he was a good person. No, he's the son of God. And so although God promised David his kingdom would last, what happened? Now, some of you smart scholars out there might say, well, his kingdom fell apart, Father, in about the year 1000 BC. Yes, his earthly kingdom. Okay. Now, when David's son, the whole earthly kingdom fell apart about a thousand years. Now, remember, David was about a thousand years before Jesus. Now, what happened? Okay. Who was David's son? Solomon. Okay, so when Solomon, David's son, died, the kingdom was divided. Now, this is what I learned in seminary, and I want to share with you. It's not too confusing, but it's fascinating. All right, the kingdoms, how many tribes of Israel were there? Twelve. Okay, ten split and went north. They were the Yankees. Okay, so ten split. The ten northern tribes, they broke away. They went to become the northern kingdom. That became Israel. Now, the two other tribes, Judah and Benjamin, they split, they went south. They became the southern kingdom. We call that Judah. So Israel was the nation of the ten tribes that split up north. Then two of the tribes, Benjamin and Judah, went south. They became Judah. Now, this is a divided kingdom. Now, first, the ten upper tribes were destroyed, and they were taken into exile. You've probably heard the Babylonian exile. This was actually before. That's called the Assyrian exile. So the Assyrians crushed those ten tribes, scattered them, destroyed them. And later, the other two, Judah and Benjamin, that went south into Judah, they were crushed, and they went into the Babylonian exile. We probably heard that. So what's going on? Okay, so the first temple, let's look at our next slide, was destroyed. Remember, that temple has got to be destroyed because Christ is the new temple. So the Babylonian exile, they destroyed the temple, but then later they built another temple, a second temple, and that was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. It's like they don't get the point. Keep building these temples, they're going to keep getting destroyed because Jesus is the temple. So this, this Christ is now the true temple, so there can't be one, and there is not currently one. In Israel, what's where the temple was? The Islamic Dome of the Rock, right? The, the mosque. And so in 587 B.C., the promise of God to David looks lost. It looks like God broke his promise I promised David's kingdom would last forever, but they just got crushed. What happened? The Davidic kingdom never really was fully restored. The 10 tribes are lost. You ever hear that term, the lost tribes of Israel? The 10 tribes are basically lost. So although the two tribes in Judah, Benjamin and Judah, they came back, they came back, basically the kingdom seems destroyed after the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. So basically that 500 years between the destruction in 587 BC, the exile, and then the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem 
in 70 AD, basically the Jews are like, there's nothing left of David. David's kingdom is gone. Now it's being completely restored through who you would never expect. A peasant woman and, and Joseph, who was of the line of David. So was Mary. They were of the line of David. Do you know that Joseph, although he was not Jesus' biological father, his legal fatherhood to Jesus was equivalent to a natural fatherhood in terms of inheritance. If you were the legal father, even though they're not the biological father, you basically had a natural fatherhood in matters of inheritance. So that's why Jesus inherited the line of David from Joseph. And God says to a virgin in Nazareth, that Gabriel, or through Gabriel, that you will be the mother of the Messiah. Now, where do you hear what's coming next? So what's going on? Well, the angel says his name will be great. So we got greatness. He's going to sit on the throne of the father David. So we have the throne. He will, you will be the mother of God, the son of God. You will be his mother. And unlike David's kingdom that failed on an earthly sense, his kingdom is restored in a heavenly sense. His kingdom will last forever. This is monumental. This is what the Jewish people have been waiting for for centuries. Now all of a sudden it's fulfilled in this little town of Nazareth. God is bringing the Messiah, undoing the entire fall of Israel in four elements. So the mystery here basically is the Davidic kings that came after David, like Solomon, they were adopted sons of God. They were put in as kings. But Mary's child will be the actual king, the son of God. And the child born will not just be holy, but will be called the son of God. As Bram Petrie said, the New Testament is concealed in the Old, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New. Now, I want to get to some really interesting things, because this all ties the Annunciation. One of them is I get letters quite a bit, not often as some other things, but Christmas is a pagan holiday. We read all the time in the comments on YouTube that you Christians are nothing but just reliving pagan holidays. First of all, the fact that one of our feasts falls on what used to be a pagan feast does not make our feast pagan. All right, my best friend shared the same birthday as Stalin. Now, does that make that day on the calendar of the year evil because Stalin's birthday was that day? My best friend used to say, I share the birthday with Stalin. Well, no, that doesn't make that day evil. It means something evil happened on that day, but the day was not created to be evil just because Stalin was born on it. Now, let's talk about this. Why is Christmas on December 25th? It ties to our feast today. Christmas is exactly nine months from today. Now, it had more to do with Jewish tradition than any pagan feasts. Why? For the Jews, this is fascinating. And this is, again, I'm taking you back to seminary because this is what I learned in seminary and I've never heard it since. For the Jews, March 25th, today, was already celebrated as the date of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Now, who's Isaac? He's the prototype of Jesus. He's the son. They walked three days up the hills. He was laid on wood to be sacrificed. This was a, a prototype of Jesus, this son, Isaac. And so the Jews already celebrated March 25th as the date of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Now, what's interesting, this is when the Lord promised to send a lamb to complete the sacrifice. So all of a sudden now, you got something really interesting. Now, listen to this. March 25th, also marked for the Jews the first day of creation. That is when the Jews marked the first day of creation. It was March 25th. When God did what? He brought forth light. Now check this out. So the early Christians recognized the connection that Jesus Christ was both the lamb that was to be sacrificed, which the Jews celebrated on March 25th, 
And he was also the light of the world, which came at creation, which the Jews also celebrated on March 25th. Now, this is amazing because they dated both then, this is the Christians, both Christ's conception, which happened when? At the Annunciation. And that's when the light came into the world. And they also dated his death because he was the lamb that was slain to the same date of March 25th. Fascinating. Now, let's look at our next slide. So if the conception was set by early Christians on March 25th, it follows that the birth of Jesus came on December 25th. Nine months later. There's nothing pagan about it. Just because it happened to be something the pagans did is similar, as I said, to my friend who happened to have his birthday on the same birthday as Stalin. And so there's nothing pagan. Pope Benedict even tells us this in Spirit of the Liturgy. Christmas is about Jesus Christ. No one else. Not some pagan, some god, some god, soul invictus, which is what every non-Christian will point out to us. Did you just see how the Christians established Christmas Day? It was based on when Jesus was conceived because the Jews believed at that time that the world began. The creation began on March 25th. So that would make the new creation, Jesus, March 25th to give us the new creation. They also saw it the day that the lamb was offered in the place of the sacrifice of Isaac. Well, that was also, Jesus Christ was also the lamb. And so just because we, we hear that people accuse the Catholic Christians as being pagan holidays, you gotta really look, does any of those people who say Christmas is a pagan holiday ever tell you this? <laughs> no, all right. What about the Hail Mary? Oh, the rosary, that's not biblical. The whole entire rosary is biblical. Remember, the rosary is not just a bunch of Hail Marys. It's about the visitation. It's about the annunciation. It's about the crowning with thorns, the scourging at the pillar, the resurrection, the assumption or the um, ascension, the uh, descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. They're all, even the assumption is in Revelation 9 or uh, 12, we believe. But basically, the rosary is meditation on biblical mysteries. It's all biblical, but even the Hail Mary is biblical. You know, I've told the story before. Uh, you may have heard it, but the last time I ever sat in a barber's chair, the last time was 17 years ago. See, now I cut my own hair. <laughs> I got to be careful because when you cut the scalp with those blood thinners, it starts bleeding everywhere. But I cut my own hair now, but back to the last time I sat in a barber's chair, I was in North Carolina, and the, and the barber who used to cut my hair, great guy, he was a, a Baptist named Billy, just an amazing man. And, and he kind of was following my story, and I was discerning the priesthood, and finally, I got to the point, and it was the spring of 2016, or 20, 2006, early in that year, 2006, and he said to me, I'm in the bar barber's chair. There's like seven chairs. And he says, are you really going to do this? Are you really going to become a Catholic priest? And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, it's up to God. But I think that's where he's calling me. And there was this guy next to me in the barber chair, this big burly guy. And you can't help but over here in the conversations. And he's getting his hair cut. And he looks over and he goes, huh. You're going to spend your entire life in some monastery praying a bunch of Hail Marys. And, and I, I look over at him and, 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 I, I, and I said, sir, I said, um, I said, can you tell me what the first chapter of Luke is about? Specifically verses 26 through 56. It says it's about the birth of Jesus. And I said, yeah, but what's in those verses? All right, first of all, the angel comes. This is the Annunciation, what we celebrate today, Gabriel. He hails her. He says, hail. Who's he talking to? He's not talking about to Zechariah. The only person in the room is Mary. Hail Mary. He hails her. He says, hail. And then he tells her she is full of grace. Not, oh, favored one. 
That is not the translation. We'll talk about that in a minute. And he tells her, the Lord is with her. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Then let's look at our next slide. Then she goes to Elizabeth in the visitation. And Elizabeth sees her and says, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So now we got Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So then Elizabeth calls her holy. Well, not technically. How? She says, blessed is she who believed what the Lord told her would be fulfilled. That's basically blessed is holy. So basically, holy Mary. She's talking to Mary. Now, what about mother of God? Elizabeth says to her, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And and, and, and this is the meaning. Okay, Holy Mary, mother of God. Now, here's the sticking point. Pray for us sinners. Okay, I follow you, he says, right up to the point where you get to pray for us sinners. That invalidates the whole entire prayer. Ah, okay. So you agree with me, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. That's all the angel Gabriel. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. That's Elizabeth. Holy Mary, blessed is she who heard and believed. Holy Mary, mother of God, how is it the mother of my Lord? You agree with me all the way up to that point. And there was this pause. But I don't agree. You do not pray for us sinners. She does not pray for us. She's dead. Well, let's look at this. This is interesting. Because is this, does the Bible say we should approach the saints with our prayers? Does the Bible say this? Yes. And I'll point just two. Revelation 5, 8. John saw 24 elders fall down before the lamb in worship and each one having a harp and golden bowls of incenses, which are the prayers of the saints. That's Revelation 5, 8. Now let's look at our next slide because we can go right into Revelation 8, verse 3. What does that say? Another angel came and stood on the altar having a golden censer, and many incenses were given to him in order that he will give it with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incenses went up with the prayers of the saints from the hand of the angel before God. But she's dead, okay? Was Moses dead on the Mount Tabor during the transubstantiation, the transfiguration? Moses had died centuries before that. So it's talking about the saints, and who's the greatest of the saints? Mary. She intercedes for us. So I'm sitting here telling this to the guy, and he's like, and so then we went on, and I said, sir, I got to ask you, you know, you know that Mary went up into the hill country, right? And so did David. What did David take up to the hill country? How long did he go up there? Three months. How long did Mary go up to the hill country of Judea? Three months. Now, granted, now they're in the hill country of Judea, the two tribes south. Jesus is going to start to bring back all these 12 tribes of Israel. Starts there. Now, David went up to the hill country of Judea for, or Judea, I'm sorry, I said Judah, Judea. For three months, Mary went up for three months. David also exclaimed, how can the ark of my Lord come to me? This is 2 Samuel 6, 9. Just like Mary or Elizabeth said, how could the mother of my Lord come to me? This is why Mary's the ark of the new covenant. Now, I asked this guy in the barber chair, what happened next? He's like, what are you talking about? I said, again, what is the first chapter of Luke, verse 26 through 56 about? He said, the birth of Jesus. I said, okay. What made that child in the womb of Elizabeth leap? Because it says, right, he leapt in the womb, right? He's like, yeah. I said, what made him leap? He said, the presence of Jesus. I said, yes. Everything goes back to the presence of Jesus. But what does the Bible say? Cause that child to leap in the womb of Elizabeth. And he's like, the presence of Jesus. And I says, Yes, it's all back to the presence of Jesus. But what does the Bible say? So Billy has this Bible up on the shelf. And I'm like, Billy, hand me that Bible. I'm praying that's not some Protestant version that took it out. 
So I get the Bible and I flip to it. And what does it say caused the child to leap in the womb of Elizabeth? The sound of Mary's voice. At the sound of Mary's voice, the child leapt in the womb. And what does that mean? Scott Hahn tells us, David danced in front of the old Ark of the Covenant. And what does the word leapt in the original language mean? To dance. John the Baptist danced in front of the new Ark of the Covenant, just like David danced before the old Ark of the Covenant. Fascinating. And he says, but I have a problem with you people. I didn't know we Catholics were you people. And he says, you can't call her co-redemptrix. Well, she didn't save us. Jesus did. Absolutely true. But Mary will now participate in the process. She's co-redemptrix, not because she's equal to God, but she gave Jesus his human nature. Now, remember, you've heard me say this before. This will be a little repetition before I go into the other stuff. The word co in Latin is cum, C-U-M. And that does not mean equal to, it means with. So Mary was not equal to God. She worked with him. She said yes. And that allowed him to receive a human nature from her. Mary's fiat means yes. We need to give ours too. Later, Mary says, and I told this to the guy in the chair, you know, Mary says all generations will call her blessed. Why can't you? Mary says that. Remember, Mary's not the goal. Mary's the guide. Mary is the GPS. She's not the final destination. My final destination today is Assumption College in Worcester, Massachusetts. That's my goal. But the way I'm going to get there is a GPS. Jesus is the goal. Your destination. Mary is simply the GPS to get you there. Now, if somebody told me, Father, you don't have that GPS anymore. I'm taking it away. I don't know how to get there. Does this mean I'm worshiping the GPS? Now, some of you might. Don't do that. I don't worship the GPS. The GPS is a tool God gave me to get to my destination. Mary is the ultimate GPS. She is a gift to help us get there. And so it says in the Bible, I said to this guy in the chair, God honored her above all creatures. So we should too. He said, but the problem with you people, you people, is you worship her. Do we worship Mary? We give the saints honor, but we do not give them adoration due to God alone. What do I mean? Okay, we honor certain humans above others, right? Do we not? What is the Hall of Fame, the NFL Hall of Fame? The honor of certain players over others. Okay, there's Barry Sanders, greatest football player of all time, being honored in the Hall of Fame because he's certainly better than any running back for the Detroit Lions like Jim, James Jones, okay? He's honored. There's nothing wrong with that. Nobody says you're worshiping. I mean, don't worship our athletes, please. Don't worship our, our, our actors, our athletes. That's not, uh-uh, just like the saints. We don't worship them. So let's look at our next slide. This is fascinating because this helps you to understand what everything is. Latria is the adoration due to God alone and only God. We as Catholics give God latria. Ultimate worship nobody else gets. Now, what is hyperdulia? The next one on there. Hyperdulia is the honor given to Mary as the greatest of creatures, but still infinitely less than God. So when somebody says, do you worship Mary? Say, uh-uh, hyperdulia is way less than latria. <laughs> the next is protodulia. This is the honor we give to St. Joseph but still immeasurably lower than the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then finally, we have Dulia. This is the honor we give to all the saints, but never, ever worshiping. When somebody tells you you worship Mary or a statue or a painting, here's the question you ask them. Do you know what it means in the Bible to worship someone or something? Oh, you say a prayer to them. Uh-uh. Prayer does not mean to worship. Prayer means to ask. Basically, I said before, when you go to court, the old language of the court used to say the defendant prays 
that the court throw out this court the case. It means we're asking. Do you ever hear I pray that I, I pass my exam? I said, are you worshiping your exam? Okay, here's the key, everybody. What in the Bible was the one designated factor to mean worship? What was the one thing that indicated that you were now worshiping someone or something? Sacrifice. If you offered sacrifice to it, you worshiped it. That's why God got upset with the golden calf. It was the fact that they were offering sacrifice to it. You want to point out to me one time the Catholic Church has offered sacrifice to a saint? Never. Never. Every single Mass, even the Mass of the Saint Day, is to honor the saint, but the sacrifice is to God alone. And so when somebody tells you you worship Mary, you say, we don't offer sacrifice to her. We don't offer sacrifice to St. Thomas Aquinas. We do not offer sacrifice to St. Joseph. We honor them. Huge difference. Hyperdulia, not latria. Protodulia, not latria. And so this is, well, this is wrong, Father. You can't even do that. No. John 17, 11. The glory, this is God talking. The glory which thou hast given me, this is Jesus talking, I have given to them. Did you hear that? Jesus said, the glory that's been given to me, I have given to them, and they will be one as we are one. That's John 17, 11. How about Romans 13, 7? Listen to this. Pay all them their due to whom taxes, to whom taxes are due. Honor to whom honor is due. Don't you think the woman that changed the history of the world and became the vessel by which the God-man came to earth does not deserve some form of honor? Instead, I get these letters and comments on YouTube and letters in the mail saying she's the whore of Babylon. She's the beast of the seven heads. and It's unbelievable. And so there's so much going on here in the Annunciation. What about the Trinity? The Trinity is revealed at the Annunciation the first time. Did you know that? Did you know the Trinity is, is revealed at the Annunciation? The Spirit will come upon you. That's the Holy Spirit. The power of the Most High, that's God the Father, will overpower you and the child to be born will be called the Son of God. That's the second person of the Trinity. The whole Trinity is revealed here. Now, this is the hypostatic union. God became a man. And the last page, we're almost done. Mary basically asks how this will happen. Now, when I was in high school and I had religion class, I remember thinking, what a raw deal Zechariah got. Because didn't he ask the same thing? How will this happen? And yet God gives Zechariah the, the divine beat down and we honor Mary. What's going on? Mary asks how this will happen. No, there's a huge difference. Mary is not questioning God's ability to give her a son. Zechariah did. Zechariah said this is not physically possible. Mary didn't say that. Mary's not questioning God's ability to do it. She's just asking how you're going to do it. Not meaning it's not possible. She's saying, I get it. It's possible. Just curious, Lord. How are you going to do this? So many, many uh, mythologies have legends about a God who had sexual relations with a woman and bore a son. This is what other people talk about Christianity. Oh, you're just copying from Zoroastrianism and all this and that. Yeah, these mythologies, the Greek mythologies, Zeus mated with this woman and out came this god. And, and it, it, this is not uncommon. But look at our next slide. The idea of a virgin birth is unique to Christianity. This privilege granted of being a virgin and a mother at the same time, unheard of, unique to only Christianity, a unique gift of God. Now, Mary says, how can this be? 
Now, here's what's fascinating. Right now, I'm going to show you why the Immaculate Conception and Mary's Perpetual Virginity, the two things we get attacked about as being Catholics all the time, they're right there in the Annunciation. But you never heard this. All right. Mary says, how can this be? Now, the church fathers all agree this refers to Mary's virginal status rather than her marital status, meaning I'm single. Here's what we're talking about. Okay. This means she must presently be a virgin and she must intend to remain a virgin. This is fascinating. Why? Why does it matter that Mary had to be a virgin? Non-Catholics just like, oh, of course Mary had sex with other people. I get that all the time. It's like, can't you even say marital relations? And, and why? It makes no sense to them. Why would Mary need to be a virgin? Or why? Let me rephrase that. She didn't have to be after Jesus was born. I mean, the virgin birth would have still been the virgin birth. But why would Mary remain a virgin after the virgin birth? Which is the disagreement between Catholics and non-Catholics. Why? Do you ever read the Old Testament? Sarah with Isaac. Anna in the Old Testament. With, uh, was he Jacob? Anna was Jacob. The list is a mile long. What were they? They were all women who were barren, unable to conceive. And all of a sudden, through the power of God, they conceive. What was the reason for that? To show that God has the power, not you. But with Mary, it was even greater. A virgin birth. And so Mary was to remain a virgin to show that in the line of Sarah and Anna and all the other Old Testament women that, were, that gave birth, it was the power of God and God alone. It was not by her own power or the power of St. Joseph. Somebody would just be able to say, well, St. Joseph did all the work. No, God did. So Mary, to remain a virgin is important. It shows God's power. So her asking why or I should say, let me rephrase that. Her asking how refers how she can have a child and remain a virgin. That was the perplexity to Mary. Otherwise, nothing about Gabriel's announcement would have confused her if she was planning on having relations with Joseph later. You know why? Because Mary was already betrothed. Mary was already given to Joseph. If Mary was planning on having sexual relations, marital relations, the announcement of Gabriel would not have been perplexing to her. Not at all, because that child would have been born in the normal course of the marital act. Why Mary is so perplexed has to mean the church fathers say that she was planning on remaining a virgin as a vow to God. And there was such a thing back then. People write me letters all the time saying this was never, ever done. Yes, it was. There were marriages that were given in ultimate chastity, a refraining from all relations. And so this, the church fathers all say, Mary must have taken a vow of lifelong virginity or she would not have asked that question. Her betrothal was a legally binding marriage. So this would not have been surprising to Mary unless she intended to forgo all sexual relations even as a married woman. You never hear this. It makes perfect sense. What about the Immaculate Conception? So that's the, that's the perpetual virginity. What about the Immaculate Conception? The, the, the angel Gabriel addresses her as full of grace. This points to the Immaculate Conception. The Latin, gratia plena, plena. Full, grace, full of grace. Now, many non-Catholics will say, no, 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 it's favored one. This is inadequate. 
All church theologians for a thousand years taught this was not the translation. The only time in the Bible where an angel addresses someone by their title and not their name is right here. And this Greek, which the Bible was written in, is revealing meaning that God has already graced Mary prior to this point. You're already full of grace. He didn't say you're going to be, oh, favored one will mean you're going to be favored when you give birth to the son, which means in the future. With the angel, it's already, you've already been given the grace. He's making her a vessel who has been, is now, and will be filled with divine grace. Not just favored in the future with the birth. Mary says, Nothing to argue that. So it's not, oh, favored one. It's full of grace. And the only way you can be full of grace is to be spotless. Right? Did it not say in the, in the garden, did God not say, I will put enmity between you to Satan and the woman? It depends on what translation. In the Dewey Reams, it says her, she will crush your head. There cannot be complete enmity between Mary and the serpent if there's even the smallest stain of sin. That would mean Satan had even a tiny bit of control over her. And if there's even a tiny bit, if, so let me back up. If there's even the slightest stain of sin in Mary, even, the, even, even original sin, that would mean Satan had some sway over her, some control over her. And that, my friends, is not complete enmity. So if Mary was not immaculately conceived, God lied in Genesis 3.15. This is what we don't understand. Now next, Mary says, God is my savior. I hear this one all the time. Mary had to have sin because it says God is my savior. Of course God is her savior. If God is needed to forgive sins after we sin, he certainly needed to prevent sins in the first place. Doesn't that make sense? Right? If Protestants think that God can forgive sins after we commit them, which they all do, why don't they think that God can prevent sin from happening in the first place? You know, it's way harder to clean something after it gets dirty than to clean it and keep it clean in the first place. And we all agree that God does that. We all agree God cleans the sins after we get dirty. Why can't he prevent someone from getting dirty in the first place? It still took a savior. This is fascinating. So why can't we agree that he could have prevented Mary from falling into that mud pit as the church fathers explain it? He did. God needed to keep her perfect so that his son can enter the womb without sin. God can't coexist with sin. Mary had to be without sin because her very DNA was running through the veins of Jesus. If you were God, wouldn't you make your mom perfect? Yes, you would. And to finish, the Annunciation shows that. It shows us that the Blessed Virgin is a perfect model for several things. Listen to this. Do you know she's a perfect model for purity? Why? Because she says, I have no relations with a man. She's pure. She's a model of humility. Why? She says, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. She is the perfect example of simplicity. She doesn't claim to know everything. She asks, how can this be? Not meaning that I doubt it can happen, just how is it going to happen? She's the model of obedience. She said yes to God. Yes, her fiat. And she has a perfect example of faith. Why? Because she believed. Elizabeth said, blessed is she who believes what is told her shall come to be. So following her example of obedience to God, we too can give our fiat. You know, do you know what the name Mary means? I'll finish with this small, small paragraph I got left. Most agree that the word Mary means lady. That's why we call her our lady or sorrowful, sorrowful. I can never say that. It's not sorrowful, sorrow, sorrowful. That's the meaning of the name. But that sorrow ultimately turns to joy because she said yes to God. 
Now, Mary's fiat, what does fiat mean? It means yes. We need to give our yes too. Now, how do you say yes to God? All right? By showing you trust him and you do his will. So if anybody asks you, did you give your fiat to God? You got to ask yourself, do I trust him and do I do his will? Remember, all the commandments roll up into one. Do the will of God. Love God, love your neighbor. All that's the will of God. Will of God, that is the key. And you can't do it if you don't trust him. Otherwise, it's a waste of your time. Do your will instead. Now, all commandments come up to that. Do the will of God, and you'll do it if you trust him. Now, how do you show someone you trust them? By doing and accepting the help they offer you. If I trust you, and you give me directions, and I lose my GPS, that's why I trust Mary. She's my GPS to get me to Jesus. But if I don't have my GPS with me, and you come up to me, and you give me directions today to get to the Assumption College, I have no idea how to get there. It's in Worcester, it's all I know. And I trust you, and you draw me a map, and I trust you, okay, I'm going to accept that help you offer me. Or I'm going to get in your car if you offer to drive me. If I don't trust you, I'm not getting in your car. But if I trust you, I'm going to accept the help you offer. I'm going to get in your car. What is the main tool that God gives us to help us? After the fall in the garden, it was the promise of a Savior, Jesus, and the gift of a mother, Mary. Now, when does God give us this gift? Right now. The Annunciation. He gave us the gift of a Savior. The promise of a Savior. And when does he give us the gift of a mother? Next slide. On the cross, on the cross, this is Jesus giving us the gift that God promised in the garden, Mary. She was given from the cross. And when we accept this gift, we trust. When we say yes, we give our fiat. This is the key. Accepting that gift of Mary is what Mary and consecration is all about. A lot of people say, I don't want to do this Mary and consecration thing. All it is, it's not worshiping Mary. It's saying yes to the gift God gave you. <clears throat> you know what also today is? It's the anniversary of the consecration of Russia. The Pope did it on March 25th on the Feast of the Annunciation. And you know what he just called out? He called all of us who have done our Marian consecration to renew it today. The Feast of the Assumption, uh, the Annunciation. If you've consecrated to Mary, renew it today. Because that's what I just tied all together. Accepting that gift of Mary from the cross is what Mary and consecration is all about. It's saying yes to the gift Jesus gives us. And the Pope said, renew your consecration to Mary today. March 25th. This is doing the will of God and how we will get to heaven. Praise be to God. Now I want to stop. That's all I got. But I saved a little video. It's only a minute and a half. This is the Church of the Annunciation in the Holy Land. Watch this little one and a half minute clip because you will actually see the grotto that Christian tradition believes that Mary was in when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. Right now, there's an altar there. And you'll see in this church, the Church of the Annunciation, this is Jeff Cavins, one of the good church scholars. And the minute and a half clip shows the Church of the Annunciation built over the location we believe that Gabriel appeared to Mary. And you can see it in this video. So take a look at the Church of the Annunciation. Hello, I'm Jeff Cavins for Ascension Presents. I'm standing right here on location in Nazareth at the Church of the Annunciation. The Church of the Annunciation is important for me, it's important for you, it was important for the whole world because it's here that the Blessed Virgin Mary said yes to the will of God and she said, be it done unto me according to your will. 
All throughout salvation history, God has said, I got a wonderful plan for you. I've got a good future for you. But you know what? That great plan and that great future isn't gonna happen just by itself. God is expecting us to say yes to His will, to join our hearts to His. And that's when we really realize His tremendous plan. So I wanna encourage you today, say yes to God. Say yes, Lord, use me according to your will. God will change your life, He'll change your family's life, your parish life. He'll use you to change the world. Say yes. Well, thank you, everybody. You could see that beautiful clip of where we believe Gabriel appeared to Mary. What an amazing gift we have in our faith, our true faith. So God bless all of you. Make this day a special day, this day of the Annunciation. Renew your Marian consecration. See the gift that God gives us in our mother Mary and see how it fulfills the promise that God made to the Davidic kingdom, to Israel, to fulfill it. And he just did. All right, so we invite you to be part of our Marian family. If Brother Mark can show, we have just a little quick slide. Please join our Marian family. It doesn't cost any money. It does not take but 10 seconds. But please visit micprayers.org and sign up. It does not cost anything. If you never donate a dollar, that's just fine. What you want to do is you want to get the graces that you get from all of our, our prayers and good works here at the Marian Fathers. And you'll share in those graces just like you were a Marian priest or brother. And that's by decree of the Holy See. Don't pass that up. And next, if you want a little deeper understanding of my talks, um, there's a DVD out that I have called Explaining the Faith Series. It's got the some of these talks on DVD. Hope you'll get a copy. You can visit shopmercy.org or call 800 4 marian M-A-R-I-A-N, 4627426. And then lastly, a couple books that I explain in more detail, Understanding Divine Mercy. You can get that at the same Shop Mercy or 800 for Marion. And lastly, with so many suicides, so much suffering in the world, my other book here with Brother Jason is, is really helpful for any kind of tragedy, suffering, or loss, not just suicide. Yes, it's called After Suicide, There's Hope but it's not just for suicides, any kind of suffering or loss. So we hope that you'll pick up a copy if you know somebody is suffering. So until next week, may Almighty God keep you and bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace, the talk has ended. Thanks be to God. Thank you everybody, God bless you. Modern life has become defined by consumerism, sometimes called consumptionism, in which one's happiness depends on one's quality of life achieved by the attainment of material goods. Many of us are focused on attaining often unneeded material possessions, forgetting about human relationships. As a result, problems arise in our lives that may prove too difficult to overcome. Those who cannot accept the fear and shame of failure may even be tempted to take their own lives. If a man who commits suicide acts out of confusion or ignorance and is therefore not fully responsible for his act, his soul will not be condemned forever by God's perfect justice. He must, however, in a pitifully painful abandonment, wait for his future happiness as many years as he would have waited to die naturally. And then he will only begin to make up for the punishment due to him. <laughs>